Greetings from the Department of Aerospace Engineering at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. My name is Kimberly Johnson. I am the Outreach Manager in the department. On behalf of our faculty, staff, students, and our alumni guests today, I would like to welcome you to Then and Now in Aerospace, a conversation between two black women aerospace engineers who graduated from our program during very different times in our history. One in 1977 during the years of affirmative action and the other in 2015 during the last year of our very first black president's second term. Speaking of first, please help me welcome our first guest. This woman is the very first black woman to graduate with a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering at the University of Michigan. Please help me welcome Barbara Richardson. Welcome Barbara. And our second guest, 2015 graduate Jasmine LaFleur. Jasmine is currently a staff project engineer at Collins Aerospace. And she is also the CEO and co-founder of Greater Than Tech, a nonprofit organization that teaches black girls about entrepreneurship and engineering. Welcome Jasmine. Ladies, we cannot wait to hear about what you have to share about your experiences and whether or not you believe climate has changed in aerospace engineering over the past 40 years. Please start out by telling us a little bit more about yourselves. Thank you, Kimberly. My name is Barbara Richardson. I am the first black undergraduate woman in aerospace engineering at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. Okay. Uh, I achieved this in 1977. I grew up in the South, the Black Belt, Jim Crow era. That was 1954 to 1972. 1977 to 1989 was my true engineering uh, career years. 1989 to 2010, uh, I was weaning myself off of engineering. Then in uh, 2010 to now, I provide housing for homeless individuals. Thank you, Barbara, for your introduction, for being the first a trailblazer. Thank you to the College of Engineering for wanting to participate in this type of conversation. Um, I'll go ahead and share a little bit about me. I am Jasmine LaFleur. I work for Collins Aerospace as a staff project engineer on the advanced design uh, business development team. So what I do from day to day is uh, manage pro uh, projects on design demonstrators, as well as like project and budget and schedule. I help write technical proposals for new bids and I aim to improve business processes for the organization so we are able to win more contracts and be more nimble for our new customers. I've been in the aerospace industry for five years, predominantly um, with the project background. So always having ownership of a component or some type of pro process. I recently received my dual masters, one from Purdue University in 2020 um, in interdisciplinary engineering. And then recently an MBA from Indiana University this past February. Outside of work, I am a co-founder of a nonprofit called Greater Than Tech, where we aim to create the next technology business leaders by teaching girls of color the intersectionality of engineering and business. And as mentioned by Kimberly, I graduated from University of Michigan in aerospace engineering in 2015, and I am a native of Flint, Michigan. Go blue. Go blue. <laughs> So Barbara, thanks again for your time. And I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. Um, I wanna go ahead and start off by asking you a few questions. And given that we were at University of Michigan in very different times, can you share a little bit about what it was like being a student at University of Michigan? And what was the time like? And can you tell us what it was like growing up in segregated South under Jim Crow laws? Starting with growing up in the South during Jeff Crow. <laughs> okay, that was my foundation. And that's where the Board of Education came about, which said you can't be separate and equal. The education system had to, if you will, integrate. 
That was in 1954. I grew up in a time where black lives were being legislated. Okay, we were given rights. We were being given rights. Okay, I thought as a kid growing up, I'm just reading what the preamble to the Constitution said that all the rights were endowed by our Creator, that I had some rights. But I learned growing up that they had to be legislated, and among them were, uh, as I said, the education part, that we had to be have facilities and resources that were equal to the ones provided by the federal government or state government uh, for white kids, okay? It was also a period where we had to fight for our, in my case, my grandmother fought for uh, the voting rights. Okay, black people were given the right to vote. We did a lot of dying and bleeding and all of that uh, to get there, but we got there. It was the march from Selma to Montgomery, and the incident happened on the Pettus Bridge where uh, the protesters peacefully, of course, were beaten. The affirmative action allowed me to go to the University of Michigan. I chose uh, aerospace engineering because uh, as a kid, the first man walked on the moon, we were told, <laughs> okay, and I didn't believe it. I was like, yeah, right, he's probably somewhere kicked back in a hotel doing this thing. <laughs> I was talking to my mother about it, and she said, well, this was during the time when I was trying to come up with a, what to do as a, uh, for college because it was a given that I was going to college. We didn't know where yet, but I was going to college. So uh, she said, why don't you check it out? Okay. I said, yeah, okay. You know, um, I was very good at math, uh, very love science. Uh, undergraduate uh, GPA was 4.0. At, on the course, all the first. I was the first uh, person in my family to go to college. Okay. And uh, what happened is I chose the University of Michigan and uh, aerospace program, first day there, orientation. Oh my God. It was very, uh, I was excited for being there for one thing. Uh, but I was quickly brought down uh, by a, it was actually a dean and uh, an assistant dean, I'm being told today, I, you know, uh, who he was uh, kind of escapes me, but what he said to me doesn't. And he said that I would not make, make it through the program, okay? I, you know, I, I grew up in the South with a mother that allowed me to speak. So the first thing I wanted to do was let this man know something. <laughs> but uh, if I'm looking at it today, I might have been intimidated. How dare this white man stand there and tell me what I can and cannot do? I'm <laughs> not, you know, uh, I was a radical during that period too. Uh, Angela Davis was and still is my idol. <laughs> okay, she, she's my girl. So my thoughts were, how dare he? So I was very upset. I had just gotten on campus, as I was saying. I met, had met uh, the minority engineering uh, program project manager. Her name is Ann Ontario. I was so angry. I, left, I had just left her office to go see the dean. And then after that, I went back to her office. And I, you know, I, I don't cry. I get angry. I turn purple. I do everything. But you know what? I'm not going to cry in front of you. <laughs> okay? So I was telling her, and my vocabulary was really raw at that time when, when I feel uh, 
<laughs> I don't know how to say it when I feel mistreated or abused or whatever. <laughs> okay, or packed. Okay, so I was explaining to her what had happened, you know, and she said, well, just prove him wrong. <laughs> you know, and that really, it made sense, but it didn't help me. I spent two years, my first two years, angry. I, I was an angry child. Not angry simply because of that. I was, I, you know, transitioning from the South to the North was uh, an experience within itself. Uh, dealing with black men and women my age who did not understand or who assumed that they were at a level higher than me. Now, I, you know, my foundation was that nobody's better than me. But my mother instilled that in me, and I believed what my mother said. <laughs> okay, but, you know, we're in the same spot, but they're better. I didn't. I couldn't uh, just wrap that and make it okay. It, it was it's a package that has never been wrapped properly and will never be, to be honest, okay? Uh, but anyway, I spent two years, my first two, freshman and sophomore years, uh, angry, uh, rebelling, not going to class because when I went to class, I was the only black in the class. Okay, and then I was the only woman in the class. And then to be the only black woman, okay, with all of these white men, younger men, kids, just like me, okay, who they just exude privilege, okay? Privilege is just a, uh, I didn't get that at that time. I have, that's a whole different story. Okay, bye. Uh, but they exude this. And, uh, you know, I, I was like, you know what? I'm away from home. I'm in control now. <laughs> I don't have to put me, I don't have to subject me to this. <laughs> okay, I'm still going to Michigan. Though. That, that, was, that was the insane part. I had to understand, uh, make myself understand that I have to develop a tool to handle that, or I will prove that Dean correct. So anyway, my grades reflected where I was at that time, okay? <laughs> and I was angry and I wasn't subjecting Barbara to going to class and, and doing all those things, interacting, if you will. I can, I can totally uh, resonate with you from the standpoint of our mothers encouraging us to learn more you mentioned you had skepticism about the first man on the moon. And I feel like that was a curiosity that you had that I could also um, recognize I had in myself because I lived by an airport and I would just see planes going over my head every so often. And all I asked my mother was, wow, like, how is this flying? How is this big hunk of metal flying? This is me as a kid. <laughs> and similar to how your mother is, saying, well, go find out. My <laughs> mom gave me a similar talk. She said, maybe one day you'll have a job where you'll know how to answer that question. So similar to you, I was very tenacious on figuring out the answer. And from then on, I did everything that I could to become an aerospace engineer at the University of Michigan specifically, because at the time that was the number one aerospace school in the nation. So I felt like I had to be the best of the best. Similar to you, I was good at math, I was good at science, but I went to a predominantly black high school and the rigor of that school was not competitive enough for the people I would have to compete with at University of Michigan. So similar to what your Dean said about you, like you won't make it, I've had counselors tell me that I wasn't cut out for engineering based off of the credentials I had coming into University of Michigan, whether it's my ACT score or something like that. So I think we both experienced um, resistance because there was, there was far and few Black women, especially in your time, eager and willing to go into aerospace engineering. And I think with me wanting to do aerospace in the 2010s, 
I think the counselors and advisors I had at the time didn't really see that type of, they didn't really see people go into STEM fields, especially aerospace. So there was a lot of resistance and backlash to think that we would actually accomplish that. And um, you mentioned that you were the only black woman, you were only black person as well as woman in your class. Did you feel that you had any level of support or a system that you could call on to help you through the classes or even just someone you can talk to throughout your time in college? Uh, you know, at the time I was going through it initially, I did not, okay. Uh, I was a member, we had started the Society of Minority Engineers, but this had a lot of mechanical blacks, of course, okay a lot of civil, a lot of double E, you, you know, and me, aerospace, <laughs> you know. So at that time, I don't think that they at that time understood where I was, okay, or what the department was like because uh, they weren't really the only. They had somebody to come to. My only salvation, if you will, or how can I say it, my uh, people that helped me was Ann Monterio and, <clears throat> and Professor Buning. Uh, Harm Buning shocked me, calling me. He would call me. They would call me, literally, hello. <laughs> Why are you home? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because my whole head was, I'm not dealing with this. So after a couple of times, uh, Professor Muirling called me, I got called to his office. And uh, he needed to understand what the, what the issues were, what was going on with me. And uh, I explained that it wasn't me. <laughs> it was the professors. And he kind of said, you know, how can you tell? You didn't, you don't go to class. You said, <laughs> you know, and I said, well, sometimes I go to class. <laughs> I go to class. But anyway, we had a conversation about it, and he and Ann had a conversation, and they came up with uh, me as being their project, and they worked with me on those issues. Uh, the professors, were asked to give Professor Buerling, oh, I don't know if it was weekly or, or bi-weekly or what it was, but a report as to my attendance. <laughs> okay, that was first and foremost, did she show up? And if I didn't show up, you know, I got to come visit. And uh, he stopped calling, totally. Uh, come see me, which is what his secretary would say. He wants to see you now. You're a professor, Muni. He wants to see you, you know. And uh, I got tired of he wanted to see me, <laughs> so I went to class. Uh, but he helped. They both actually helped me uh, understand how to deal with uh, as best I could with the times and the uh, people who had the power. Of course, Anne being black, she would give me a whole different type thing, but they were all, and he being the professor and you know, he's done his thing. Uh, he would come from a different level, but between the two, I patched them together and junior and senior year, I was president. Okay. Uh, I did my work and uh, I was happy I graduated. So on graduation day, I went to see the dean that said I uh, would not go through the program and let him know that, look at this. <laughs> I say, do you see that name? <laughs> and you know, to be honest, and I don't know if he even remembers saying that, okay? He probably did though, because I didn't just say that and leave. I just had to make sure I, you know, I, and I let them know that when you say something to a child, that those words hurt. Those words can pick them out the system or keep them in. I said, for me, I said, 
you're not you're not that good. You you can't just kick me out and I'm gone. <laughs> you say that and I'm gone. I don't think so. You know, and then I'll go. And uh, but that's an experience that stay that's still with me today. I uh, it angers me because I don't because I think that it's probably still being done. And I don't know or feel confident that black women today, little babies today, in my eyes, okay, have the are armed to handle things like that. <coughs> yeah, I can I can relate to that too. I've had advisors tell me that I was not cut out for engineering. Mind you, Barbara, I had to do a cross-campus transfer where I actually didn't get into the College of Engineering when I applied in high school. I was accepted to the College of Literature, Science, and Arts, as well as the Comprehensive Studies program where I had to do a semester in the summer before the fall semester. So I would be competitive in the fall or have some supplemental supplementary training for me to be prepared. And with me being in that program, the advisor I had at the time, they gave me the, you should do this instead talk by nature of my ACT score. And she pretty much said to me, hey, you need to have fun at Michigan and major in general studies and ultimately be a manager at Target. And although I love sharp shopping at Target and I aim to be a manager one day, me telling her that I was interested in engineering, aerospace engineering, it felt as though she did not hear what I was saying and she didn't understand how I could achieve that type of goal. And similar to you and your relationship with Harm Buning, I feel like the person who had my back was Professor Louis Bernal. As I was attempting to do this cross campus transfer, I can't say that I had all of the requirements fully um, completed, but I told him how interested I was in aerospace and the type of classes that I've taken so far. And he told me, okay, why don't you just take one class? We'll see how you do and we'll go from there. And lo and behold, it was Aero 201. I loved the class. I learned about aerospace flight maneuvers, that type of thing. And had he not given me that opportunity, I would have never known that aerospace was something I was willing to work hard for, as well as just general interest from a practical standpoint. I mean, I knew as a kid, I thought planes were cool, but to actually sit and do the equations and understand the different flight maneuvers was a totally different playing field. So I just appreciated that someone like him, who obviously had power, was able to look at my interests or look at who I was as a person and give me the opportunity to take a class like that because I would have, if I would have just stopped at the prerequisites, I wouldn't have known if aerospace was for me or I wouldn't have known what type of environment I was going into. So I always think about Professor Bernal to this day because in a lot of ways, I feel like if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have even been able to progress on my aerospace journey. Uh, Jasmine, did you have, were there uh, more than one black, more than one woman, more than one black woman in your classes? Yeah, so there were a few black students, maybe two or three, but luckily when I was um, in the aerospace department, I had my friend Sydney who was there and we essentially did all our aerospace classes together. To this day, she's one of my best friends and we firmly believe that if we did not have each other in aerospace at University of Michigan, like we don't know if we would have made it. This was somebody who was my confidant, my friend, my sister. We spent many of nights in the Deuterstadt doing picnics and potlucks, like literally staying in the library, <laughs> like weekends on end to make sure that we are passing our classes, we're doing our assignments. We were true accountability partners and thinking about you being the only one 
woman and black person in your class, I just can't even imagine being in that type of environment because I needed somebody to help me through the hard times. So it's just very, I don't know, almost like heart wrenching in a way to think about going through an experience like that by myself. What I learned and what I learned is I, I built uh, boundaries. Okay. Uh, once I understood that, you know, I was going to graduate. Okay. That I, do, I was going to do the work to get me to graduate. Right. Uh, I had to build boundaries, you know, support come in if you didn't support. You know, uh, unfortunately, when I went, part of the problem that I had at first when I went to Michigan was that I didn't have anybody to look up to. Nobody looked like me in my class, okay? My mom couldn't help me because she hadn't, she hadn't gone to college, <laughs> you know, come on, <laughs> okay, miss me especially. And uh, I had to deal with not having a support system, okay? Not having a support system. That is the most important thing. And you know, the interesting part, and I, this is a little aside thing, is like uh, listening to the uh, journalists talk about Kamala Harris being becoming VP. Uh, the little girls got someone to look up to, someone that looks just like them. Is that is still relevant today? I'm like, you know what? That makes sense to me. If you can see it, you can do it. You know, or you feel you can anyway. And uh, basically, uh, that's what I would like for other women in engineer, black women in engineering to experience, okay? Uh, I never had that. <laughs> yes, I'm jealous. I'm really jealous, <laughs> you know, but I'm very happy that you guys don't have to go through that, what I did, okay? Uh, my personality, that helped form my personality. It almost seems as though I could say that I've probably experienced the same type of racism and sexism that you've experienced, but just maybe in a more um, kinder face. You know, you talk about Kamala Harris and the type of representation we have today, but truthfully speaking, it's still very far and few for women of color to be in high positions, leadership positions, especially from a tech, tech standpoint, <laughs> clearly aerospace specifically. So um, yeah. I've definitely had a lot of, experienced a lot of microaggressions and, and biases. There was one class in particular where we had to do some lab tests and test reports. And I worked on a team with three mainstream male and there was one person on the team who elected himself to review the report. So him and I were in the computer lab and he's reading over the report and he comes across a paragraph and he says, this is bad grammar. This is bad grammar. Why would you write this? He's saying to me. And I look at the paragraph he was referring to and I realize that it's not a paragraph that I wrote. So then and there, I realized that he thought I wrote it more than likely because I was the only woman and Black person on the team. And I just thought how presumptuous for him to think that I had bad grammar compared to the other teammates. And it was pretty embarrassing for him because he obviously showed that he has some biases against me, but it also put me down in a way because I realized that he didn't see me as competent. And I felt that that was something that was almost a common theme when I worked on team projects with guys who haven't had a lot of interaction with 
women or, or, or black people in general, there were some, there were some stereotypes that I felt that I had to navigate through. Could you share something that made you feel that you were being judged based off of your race or even um, being a woman? Um, oh man, where do I start? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, let's go workplace because we, you know, we've done U of L a lot. Uh, the workplace is really no different uh, other than it is the workplace, not school, but you're still learning. Um, and this was after a while. It wasn't even my first initial uh, engineer, you know, period. Um, I had become a manager, okay. My group was large at 45 men, okay. Uh, I never worked with another woman. Uh, not <laughs> only, I had one draft woman. Okay, but no engineer, no nothing else my whole career. But okay, that was an aside. One of the people that uh, was in my group that I was his manager tried to show me up before he got to know who I was and how I did. Okay, uh, so we're in design review going over projects. I had already, uh, you know, okayed his, his, and was ready for, it was ready for design review, and it was, okay. So we get in design review, which had my boss, my coworker, a couple of my coworkers, people, you, you know, and a couple more people from my group. And he just comes out and say, I had to show her this and did you know this? <laughs> my, my my boss, which was the head of the department, just look, he was shocked <laughs> that somebody would say that and not be sitting there. Okay. <laughs> so he just he didn't say nothing. He just looked. I looked and I said, you know what, just continue on so we can go. You know, and blah 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 blah. And then so we left, we went back to the office. That's my style. We go back and we talk about what happened. And I told him, I said, next time you do that, you know, don't forget I have hire and fire privileges. Okay, the next time that you do that, everybody who can approve my firing was sitting there. My boss is sitting there. Okay, so if I decided you got to go, you at least got to go now, okay? You might be back tomorrow, but he's going to make you go now, okay? So don't ever do that again. And I said, plus, always remember, I had to, I learned it, okay? And I told him the name of the older dude. I People in my group were like, the oldest one was like 65. I was a kid. And, you, you know, he's an engineer, very seasoned, very good, and very Slow and teaching. Okay. Not teaching a boy. He could teach me. <laughs> and he had no issues doing that. You know, there are two ways to skin a cat, at least two ways. And in the engineering, there are lots of ways to get to the bottom line. You had a good idea. I approved that idea because it was good. I had a different one. Okay. And I'm sure if I had put it out in the group, they will come up with something different. I said, you know, learn what engineering is about and then speak. Otherwise, but don't speak to me and don't speak about me ever again. Or I will fire you on the spot. Understand that. Okay. I am not, he has, I am not the type of person who could hold my temper. Okay. That's, that's unfortunate. I've learned. But anyway. Uh, that was one of the times, yes. <laughs> I can, I can, I can relate. <laughs> uh, I've had instances where I've faced disrespect and I didn't know if it was because I was a younger engineer on the program, a woman, black, whatever the case may be, but 
I've had to develop a muscle where I was able and very firm on letting people know when they've disrespected me and almost making an example out of them for them to not do it again. And sadly, I feel that I've gained respect when I make sure that I am clear on the boundaries and then those people are my best friends after that. <laughs> for example, there was a time where I had a supplier issue. I was a supplier design um, equipment engineer and it was my job to manage the suppliers who were doing the qualification and certification tests of this program. And there was a requirement that was missed. So it was considered an escape and I had to have a meeting and bring in all the stakeholders of that program. And there was one engineer on the team who essentially bum rushed my, my meeting and said, I don't like your approach. I don't like how you said this. So instead of being defensive, I just said, okay, well, how about you tell us what you think? What's your solution? And he proceeds, he tells us his story, but the way that he demanded that he have the platform and he was very, uh, he was disagreeing with my approach. I've gotten some messages from the other stakeholders of that team after the meeting and they are saying, oh, we noticed that he did this to you. So sorry, are you okay? Are you okay? And I felt that I was more frustrated with the people reaching out to me after the meeting because they were aware that this person was being rude and disrespectful, but they did not speak up for me during the meeting. And I felt that when bad behavior like that goes unchecked, that creates a toxic work culture, especially for people who look like us where we're far and few. So when people aren't necessarily standing up for us and we feel isolated, even though I was, wasn't wrong in my approach, he just didn't agree with it. No one backed me up. No one caught out that behavior. And if it wasn't for me reaching out to that person who bum rushed my meeting afterwards and saying, hey, I noticed that you didn't like my approach. Can you be very specific on what you didn't like? And I can work out a solution that suits both of us. And my manager appreciated me sending that note, but that was a moment where I had to stand up for myself and I had to be very clear on what I would and would not tolerate. But at the same time, I was a little disheartened to know that my teammates saw and they were aware of what happened and they didn't necessarily shut that behavior down then and there. And it sounds like that's something that you experienced too. Oh yeah. I, and you know, one of the most, pro, uh, how do you say prolific, I guess, is a time when, uh, and it was about appearance, okay? I am a black woman. I'm very natural. I've always worn an Afro. Michigan, it was larger than it was. I have a picture, okay? It was, it was larger. And I've worn it shorter. And now COVID got me with this, okay? <laughs> so, but... Uh, we were out at a lunch, okay? We, we give uh, going to weigh lunches and stuff. And uh, one of the young guys said, uh, Barbara, how do uh, your, you know, he said, your hair looks just like somebody. And it, you know, Ruth had gone away. We were, we were talking about Ruth's, uh, it had gone away. Uh, I forget what was in then, okay? But uh, another black slave type movie. And uh, it was like, you know, your hair makes you look. And, you know, I was, I was gone. But my coworker said, you know what? You need to shut that down and you need to do it now. Remember, we are uh, bound by EEO, EEOC, okay? Uh, where you just can't say what you want to say to women, minorities, any of them, <laughs> okay? But I was ready to lie to his rear. And, uh, you know, I, I, it's like privilege. That's, that's what I say. They think 
that they can say anything. And that is a no, no. Okay, well, EEOC, that means that if you say that to me, I can go in. That's a grievance. <laughs> okay, that's a grievance. We had to be trained in that area. We took training for that. So you should know that. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah, I, I, I can relate with the ma- the natural hair styles. I feel that uh, now it's a little bit more accepted, and I think there was legislation for that. But <laughs> um, being your authentic self in the workplace, did you feel that there were times where you needed to assimilate to fit in or stay under the radar, or have you always been who you are at I, this is Barbara. I've I you know you can ask people who knew me back when. I don't change much. I tweak. I like me. Okay. I like my hair. Okay. And if I don't like it, I'll cut it down or I'll let it grow out. Okay. I I don't do my hair. I'm up 10 years old and I haven't had heat in my hair since whoo. I'm 10 years, <laughs> okay? It, I mean, since my mother, honestly, since my mother stopped taking care of me, okay? And I've been growing for a long time, you know? Uh, and that's because I like this. I like I like the easy shape, and it's a good thing. I'm gone, <laughs> okay? I like that. And as long as I don't disrespect, as long as I don't, in my positions, when I don't come in, I wouldn't go in uncombed. Okay, I keep it combed now. Okay, at home, I might not comb it if I'm there for a week. I might not comb it all weekend, but Monday morning when I get ready to go out, especially to work, I comb it. Okay, and I put it into what I think is presentable. And so far, I haven't had any, let's put it like this issues okay that if there are word that it hasn't been said to me that's the way i look at it because i'm not going to ask anybody to do anything to their hair or their hair because i feel uncomfortable who am i <laughs> you know that's again that's privilege you know but we have to understand there's a line i have a, a Boundary as I get older is coming in. I'm shedding a lot of armor. That's <laughs> inspiring. I feel like I can't always say that I've felt like I could be my authentic self in the workplace, let alone college. And I, I feel like it's a skill that I had to develop. So I love that you are you own your space and you are who you are and you're unapologetic about it. I feel like that's very difficult to master sometimes. And to your point about privilege, I feel that being one of the only in certain spaces, to me, that feels inherently uncomfortable at times. Mm -hmm. There's no one you can really relate to. And it feels like it's all eyes on you. You stick out like a sore thumb. Mm -hmm. So for someone to talk about comfort or being uncomfortable to your point it is a privilege to I guess be uncomfortable for 10 minutes versus the entirety of their career or a meeting or whatever the case may be so I I appreciate you sharing that now and I listen when the customer has complaints because I need to understand what you're trying to say okay and where you think that I fell short, okay? And don't think that I have never fell short. Yes, that's okay. I had to learn failure, okay? That that was, and let it be okay. It, you know, that, that was hard. That was a hard thing because I've always been from little girl all the way to the grown up. I've always been black and white. No gray area. <laughs> you know, so when stuff started getting gray, I, I was scratching my head and shaking it. <laughs> so Barbara, being working in a male dominated field, it sounds like you were comfortable with yourself, but did you feel the the pressure of 
I'm going to use a colloquialism that I've heard a lot growing up, but you have to be uh, work two times as hard to be just noticed. So did you feel like you had to work a lot harder than your peers to be respected? Uh, you, you know what? My goal starting out was to know, know stuff. Okay. So it didn't come from the outside. It came from Barbara. Okay. I, I felt that like a project, right? If we had, if we put together a system, I had to understand what was expected of that system, what the interfaces were, because you have a lot of players putting the system together. Okay. I, I had to understand or appreciate who was doing what. Okay. And, you know, uh, like military, the military or the government, should I say, was my vendor. That was where I, that was my pacifier. That was where I cut my teeth with those guys, okay? And, you know, they give you a spec that defines everything, but it costs money if you got to tear something down just to get a $2 screw. Okay, for way back then. So you got to know maintainability, reliability, that type of stuff. Okay, you got to know that. And when everything interfaces, so when it's interfacing with my stuff, I want to make sure that you understand, uh, that I have confidence that you understand what it is, what the whole thing is, or what your interface with me is. Uh, so I always require Barbara understand what the interfaces were not get in there with the nuts you know the nuts and bolts uh, no but I'd go to if I was uncomfortable about interfaces I'd go to uh, that group design reviews okay and uh, listen and see and if it was something that I wasn't comfortable with I'd invite them to my and my groups okay just so that we could understand how to put this thing together. I think that part of being the only at Michigan, okay, uh, being the only woman, being the only black, uh, even being the only of two, okay, black woman. You got two women, right? Taught me or gave me the sense that I need to put, I need to understand the interfaces. And uh, by doing that, it, I've carried it all the way through life. Even now, even now with uh, my housing, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't live on an island, <laughs> you know, so I have to interface with all these other things. That's why, you know, I can give them housing but they need things, health care, you know, IDs, that type of stuff. So I need to provide that or make sure that it's, they can get to it. And uh, mm -hmm. that's who I am. I don't know. Were there women who came after you, whether it's Black women or just women in general, um, in the engineering field where you were able to mentor them or what, what were the relationships like with other women? And, and did you feel like you almost in a way were, were tokenized where you had certain expectations since you were one of the only? I, I was the token, the joker, if you will. <laughs> okay, the trump card because I didn't have uh, people I didn't have my whole career. I, you know, uh, listening to you all at MLK Day and just listening, you know, I was like, wow, they had more than I did. And then I started thinking, did I have other women? And you know, I couldn't find one in my whole career. When I was leaving, getting ready to come out of my career, uh, there was a rookie, a uh, first year engineering female, white, okay? Rest of the time, didn't have them. Didn't have one. I was like, God, 
<laughs> and, you, and I didn't really notice it. You know what I'm saying? I got what I needed outside of engineering. Okay. When I needed to touch with black, get some black, I went to where the black was. Okay. If I needed to have, uh, only thing I couldn't get outside of uh, outside of engineer was engineers. Black women engineers. I didn't have any of those. I didn't run across them until I like went to schools or something. And they was rare. So. So do you have any advice or ideas on what black women can do in the next stage to get ahead and, and what that would look like? To get ahead in engineering, they're already graduated. You mean? Yes. Uh, I'm I'm thinking in industry. This is advice for me. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh you you know. My advice would be, first of all, always be true to you. If you stop and you look at you, this is, and I'm giving away secrets, so marching, we might have to cut this out. But, <laughs> but what, uh, if you're comfortable with you, you can always feel negativity or something you need to check. You can, if it comes in your space, you can feel it. Okay, nine times out of 10, you're gonna be correct. Always trust it and you'll be correct nine times out of 10. Okay, that, that's what I would say, trust you to know. And always put yourself and you know what, you're, what you wanna do in engineering. Okay, you, you already got a goal. Like you had a goal to go to U of M's arrow department and graduate. Okay. You already have a goal. You might have to think about it, but you got the goal. Think about it, define it, and figure out how you're going to get there. And always, yes. Trust you to be okay. Uh, if you are not okay, trust you to have you. It's all about you. Okay, it's about being comfortable with yourself. People outside, we went to Michigan. And I say this and I say it. On a good day, it's a good thing. On a bad day, it's not very good. But we learn how to deal, okay, with white men. We learned that. They taught us that because we went to the classes and we dealt with them, okay? Don't throw it all out. You graduated, okay? So you did something right. Now you got to understand what you did, okay? And, you know, privilege with white men, I, I'm finding out, is uh, a cover or a cloak, if you will. They think just because. But call them running. Now, I haven't dealt with white women. And uh, I had one that... Graduate the same time I did, only one. And that's the only one I've dealt with. I, I didn't have women <laughs> engineers, okay? So it's like, I don't know about them much, but I would put the same thing on them because I don't know why that color gives them, in their mind, you know, clout. But so does you, yours. And that's the way I look at it. You know, yeah, you're white, I'm black though. <laughs> okay, and yes, you might, I, you might think you're legislating for my rights, but you know what? I went to Michigan, I'm making a dollar and everybody understand green. Always remember that people understand green. They understand that, that's universal language, okay? And uh, you can get, a lot of things done that you want in your life by understanding that fact. Now we must, we shouldn't be telling all the secrets out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that you are being transparent and honest <laughs> and I want to emulate that. I feel like I haven't always felt I could be my authentic self. So it's very refreshing seeing someone like you just living their truth and um I, I guess i wanted to 
veer off a little bit into your your new um, role or what you're doing currently. So you mentioned that you are uh, you change fields to um, help the homeless get housing. What motivated you to do that, and how is that going right now? Okay, what motivated me really to leave engineering was I had relatives. My nephew was going to war. And I, you know, my career was making war toys, okay? Uh, and I didn't want to be designing something that would kill or it could be used against them because, you know, we sell our toys to other countries, not as they are for us, but a version of still deadly. So, I, you know, I was like, okay, can't do that. And plus, I probably was burnt out, <laughs> okay? But uh, housing, I, I feel that there are two things that the United States of America should never have anybody, any citizens without, and that's housing and food. We are too rich. Why are people living like this, you know? And we're, we're very helpful to third world countries, but it's so sad when we look like third world countries in certain areas. That's a problem to me. I like seeing people do better. Okay. I would like to see them do well, but you know, uh, getting them off the street is better. So I like that. I like, I like understanding that I help do that. Okay. I appreciate hearing you. Uh, such a big heart for the homeless. I feel that that's definitely something that it's a lot of um, that, like a bad rep sometime or get lost in the cracks that people don't usually look at as a, a societal issue. Right. Um, I'm also in the nonprofit space where I want to help girls of color um, not only be interested in engineering, but also entrepreneurship. So they know that they have the ability to choose if they want to be in a corporate setting or if they want to create their own corporate setting. So um, I love that we're both helping people. And um, something that I've heard along the way is that engineers make the best business people. So I feel that you know, with us both having the engineering background, I love that we're both using our smarts for good in a way, creating exactly. opportunities for others. Exactly. But um, I did want you to share more about just, I guess, your hope for the future or your your rent in a way. What does Barbara feel like we need to do next? What does Barbara believe in? Share about it's almost like a soapbox. What, what's something that you want people to take away from this conversation? Okay. What, you know, I, I will want, what I do want is for us as engineers already, Black women, to nurture, to show up for our little, little students before they become students at the U of M types, okay? Any scientific engineering school is good, okay? And we definitely should uh, try and show them the way, be available to them, okay? Me, I like to know that there's a phone number. Not that I'm gonna use it, because I'm, I'm kind of, believe it or not, shy that way, okay? But I like to know that if I really need it, so I could call Barbara and say, hey, da 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 okay? Or could you show me, or could you tell me where to go, or could you, you know, provide help, resources, or whatever it is? And I can yay or nay it, of course. But it's important, I think, that we show up. I think that we need to make sure that the kids, and I'm gonna stay with black girls, okay, understand that we as black women engineers are here. We are here. We might be sprinkles here and there, but we're here. 
I, I would like to have uh, us come up with a like a little shop or a little weekend or a little whatever camp type deal to show the young ladies that we're just human too. You know, whatever we've done in life, it's not, not real. It's a big deal. But it's not really a big deal. They too can do it. They too can do what we did. And hopefully they'll do it better. Hopefully all the things that you and I are talking about, the oneness and all of that, will be uh, eradicated. Okay. I, I know it's going to take a long time, but hey. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And yes, that is definitely why I started uh, Greater Than Tech. And I feel that it's important to note that everybody doesn't have the same um, resources to even know what is possible. You spoke about representation and obviously that to me is one of the biggest things that needs to be um, shown for girls of color to know that they can do it. And I commend you for getting through the program and being an engineer because it sounds like you really didn't have much um, many mentors or um, yeah. idols to let you know that that was possible and exactly. even in my experience I felt that the counselors who thought that I couldn't do it they just didn't know a lot of black women that were in aerospace for them to encourage me to do so I think it's so important for us to encourage the next generation but I also feel that it's important for people to recognize that potential and capabilities show up in different ways. Exactly. Um, I spoke a little bit about my cross campus transfer into engineering. Now, someone will look at that situation and say, you weren't cut out for engineering. You didn't get into the program. But someone else could look at that situation and say, well, you worked really hard and you did certain things where you could get into the program. So obviously you're worthy. And I feel that something that hinders people for, from feeling that they are capable is the status quo and standardized tests and mm -hmm. the resume, things where there are metrics in place that determine who you are and how good you are. But people are so much more than just their resume, their GPA, their ACT score. And I feel that especially girls of color, there's an untapped potential for seeing what they can actually do and how they add value. Because when we're grading everybody on the same scale, it's not really feasible to think that everybody has the same resources to compete for the same game. So- exactly. That's something that I would challenge people to start thinking about. How do we reframe if someone made good choices versus if they had good choices to make? And if someone isn't necessarily worthy because they don't have a 4.0 or a 3.5 versus someone who does, did that person with a 4.0, did they work harder than the person with 3.0? That's based off of the the adversity or the life circumstances that they had so yeah. I would want people to um, understand from this conversation that everybody has a story and everybody's capabilities are different and are highlighted in different ways and we need to think of how we can think about um, potential from an equity standpoint and based off of everyone's life circumstances versus just the rule of thumb. Well, thank you so much, Barbara. I appreciated having this conversation with you. And I love that we were able to share our experiences. And I was very surprised on what was similar and what wasn't, but it's not a lot of times where I get to interact with the first aerospace graduate, first black woman aerospace graduate from University of Michigan. So I'm very honored to have this conversation with you and, and thank you for being a trailblazer and go blue. Go blue. And then thank you, Kimberly, for affording me to be able to have this. 
I, I really appreciate it. I think that, you know, the com conversing with you and dealing with the other uh, participants have shown me that we are still doing well. It's not as fast as I want. I want the whole sandbox to be dumped over. We're just doing it one grain of sand at a time. And, you know, it's okay because we're still doing it. One day we're going to get that box, you know. So thank you very much for sharing with me.